The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the Father, as just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. Do the words of this Sunday's Gospel bother you? I would think so at first hearing. Imagine for a Jew living at the time of our Lord, hearing that teaching for the first time. Immediately a good Jew would have thought, well the Torah forbids the drinking of blood and the drinking of even meat with blood in it. The Torah forbids even coming into contact with a corpse that rendered someone unclean and someone would have to go through purification rituals and so on. So when they hear Jesus say, drink my blood, eat my flesh, they must have been rather disturbed. But before we just dismiss the gospel passage, we have to accept four premises. The first premise is, Jesus meant what he said. When we look at the gospel and take a teaching like the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, we have no problem with that. Jesus meant what he said. So we have to presume here too, Jesus meant what he said. Also, second premise, the words mean what they say. There's no symbolism here. The words literally translated are eat, drink, flesh, blood. Third premise is Jesus starts off saying, amen, amen, I say to you. This was a rabbinic phrase that meant like, get ready, here's the main teaching, listen. And then lastly, the fourth premise, they begin to quarrel. And our Lord doesn't put an end to it. Our Lord doesn't say, oh, stop quarreling. You misunderstood me. You didn't get the idea behind this. No, our Lord actually intensified the teaching. So with those premises, we have to take to heart this gospel message. Also, keep in mind, St. John recorded this. So the Gospel of John was written sometime after Pentecost and before the year 70, before the fall of Jerusalem. So inspired by the Holy Spirit, St. John committed this teaching to writing. If anyone were going to eliminate a difficult teaching, something that seemed hard to take, it would have been this one. But St. John included it. So with all of that said, we come to that question, how? can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, we shouldn't start with that question, but more like, who is this man? Jesus has performed many miracles. He performed at the beginning of the Bread of Life discourse, that multiplication of five loaves and two fish that fed over 5,000. He's already performed miracles like raising Lazarus from the dead, curing the blind man, exercising demons, curing the paralytic. He did all those miracles to show he is God. He is truly God who has the divine power that supersedes time and space, laws of science, whatever it may be. He does what only God can do. 
So if one accepts Jesus as the one who performs miracles, true God, we'd have to say he must be able to somehow share with us miraculously his body and blood. Then we go on. The question has to be answered, though, really in the future. Jesus said, the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. So to appreciate this teaching, and really the past three Sundays of teachings that we've heard in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, we remember this teaching is premised on the future, because there we see the answer. At the Last Supper, Jesus takes bread and wine. Jesus says, this is my body over the bread, this is my blood over the wine. So with the same efficacious words by which you could multiply loaves, cure the blind man, raise the dead Lazarus, and so on, Jesus miraculously, mysteriously, was sharing his body, blood, soul, and divinity with his apostles. He instituted the gift of the Holy Eucharist. But this Last Supper has to also be seen as connected with Good Friday. For the next day, our Lord's body hung on that cross. His blood was spilt. In the eyes of faith, we see Jesus as the priest who offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. By his blood, our sins were washed away. But then on Easter, Jesus rose from the dead to give us the hope of everlasting life and then ascended so that we can be assured he has prepared a place in heaven for us. So this is one saving event, Last Supper, sacrifice, resurrection, ascension, that is really the context for the beautiful gift of the Holy Eucharist. So when we gather here for Mass, we plunge ourselves into that ever-living reality, that mystery of Last Supper, sacrifice, resurrection, and ascension. The priest, who acts in the person of Christ by virtue of holy orders, offers the bread and wine. He pronounces the words of Jesus. Really, it's Jesus who is speaking those words, so that when the priest says, this is my body, this is my blood, it is Christ who speaks those words, and that bread and wine truly are transubstantiated into his body, blood, soul, and divinity. Remember, the accidents, the characteristics do not change, but the what it is, the substance does. So when we receive Holy Communion, we are receiving Christ. He miraculously, mysteriously, is sharing with us his body, blood, soul, and divinity, his life, and his love. Keep in mind, this isn't some sort of like spiritual cannibalism. I've heard that objection from people who are not Catholic. Because a cannibal is a person who kills someone else to eat that person. So he eats a dead person and he satisfies himself. No, Christ is offering us his life. Christ is the crucified, risen, glorified Lord and Savior. So the living Christ is sharing with us his life and love in the Holy Eucharist. While we are receiving Holy Communion, we aren't simply consuming Christ. No, actually Christ is consuming us in his love. He is using his life and love through the Eucharist to transform us and to make us part of his life and also the body we know, the church. So this is our understanding of this great gift of the Holy Eucharist. Now some people might say, well, still, how do you know? Well, we'll never know scientifically in a way, but we can know through faith. So for instance, a proof would be, this is what we've always believed. So if we go to, for instance, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who died in the year 109 as a martyr, he was a student of St. John the Apostle, he was a bishop of Antioch, Syria, he wrote in 109, or about that time, for not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these, 
But since Jesus Christ our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him is both the flesh and the blood of the incarnated Jesus. We've always believed this. This is attested to because we're here for Mass, the same kind of Mass that Jesus and the Apostles celebrated. And every time we go to a Catholic church, how beautiful it is to find the tabernacle and know Christ is present in the Blessed Sacrament. We pray and we know we're in the presence of Christ. How beautiful that is. A great proof of faith that this is what we've always believed, but this is a living faith demonstrated by the faithful. A second proof would be evil recognizes this. Today, throughout the world, there will be Satan worshipers that come to Mass and their whole purpose is to obtain a consecrated host. They will use that host tonight to desecrate it in what they call their Black Mass, an atrocity. So if Satan worshipers are looking for the Holy Eucharist, then there must be something to it. I remember when I was a teenager, and I grew up in Springfield, so in Georgetown, a, church, a Catholic church had been desecrated. Satan worshipers had gone in, they made some satanic symbols on the altar, they desecrated the altar, broke open the tabernacle, took some of the hosts. And as a teenager, I was thinking, well, if Satan worshipers want the Holy Eucharist, it must be real. It must be real. Otherwise, they wouldn't bother. But another proof is really a miraculous one to help us poor little human beings believe the dear Lord does provide miracles. And some of those deal with the Holy Eucharist. One of my favorites deals with a miracle that occurred in Lanciano, Italy in the year 700. Lanciano is this little town on the Adriatic coast, almost directly opposite of Rome. There's a little monastery at that time known as the Monastery of St. Longinus. Now it's known as the Monastery of St. Francis. But there, in the year 700, a priest was offering the Mass. He was going through struggles. He wondered, does it really happen? When I say these words of consecration, is there really a change here? And he prayed for faith. He wanted to believe. So he is offering Mass. As he pronounced the words of consecration, that bread and wine changed totally, not only in substance, but in its characteristics. It truly appeared as human flesh and blood in the chalice. Of course, he was aghast. I would have passed out myself. But, you know, he calls up the other monks, and the monks look at this, and they realize what has happened, so they preserve these elements. The bishop comes, proclaims, yes, this is a miracle. The reliquaries have been sealed for centuries, and this has been venerated as a miracle. The interesting part is that in 1971, Pope Paul VI allowed a team of scientists and doctors, mostly from the University of Siena Medical School, to come and examine these elements using modern scientific techniques. So they did, and they found out that the blood is truly human blood, type AB positive, which is very unusual for us, but in the land of Palestine, not unusual at all. It also matched the blood type from the Shroud of Turin. Also, the properties of the blood weren't like dead blood. No, it was like living, fresh blood. The protein structures and so on, like living, fresh blood. And then with the flesh, they found that it had been taken from the heart muscle, the myocardium. And again, the protein structures were that of humans, but also it was like fresh flesh, not cadaver flesh. This is a miracle. And that's what the scientists said. This is something truly miraculous. They repeated the experiments 10 years later in 1981, and they came to the same conclusions. So a miracle to help us believe. A couple of years ago, I went to the little town of Lanciano, and there they have the reliquary as truly a wonder to behold. And it moves our faith to believe that when we receive Holy Communion, Christ miraculously mysteriously is sharing 
his body, blood, soul, and divinity, his life and love with us. He is coming to share in our lives and unite us more fully in his life. So, what do we say? I say, take time this week to go back to the beginning of chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. We have one more Sunday to conclude the sequence. But go back and reread this. These are beautiful words. And think of the great gift that the Holy Eucharist is, a gift to be cherished. Going back to that question, how? Well, it's all about faith when we get down to it. Like St. Thomas Aquinas said, for those who believe, no explanation is necessary. For those who don't, no explanation is possible. So believe, believe in the great gift of the Holy Eucharist. May God bless you.